Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, world class bass god with Kenny G, Stevie Nicks, and more. Val Johnson. And now, Rich Redman. What is up, rock and rollers? Rich Redman here. It's another exciting edition of the Rich Redman Show, coming to you from Nashville, Tennessee, and West Hollywood, California. Jim, what is happening there today, man? Catch me up really quick. I see my logo, but I also see a a bunch of Marvel gear. Yeah, of course. What do you expect? I've got uh, the I've got Mjolnir behind me, and you know Cap's shield. And if I could turn on another other camera over here, I would be able to show you uh, the Iron Gauntlet. How do you like the new office? Which is over there. I love it. It's you deserve it. There. You deserve it, man. You know, you've got a, a house full right. of children and activity it's and funny chaos. You should, bring that up. you should bring that up, Rich. I deserve a lot of things. So I'll just put it out there. <laughs> you no, know, the Iron Gauntlet, the Iron Gauntlet's on page 137 in the Kama Sutra. If you want to check that out. <laughs> Most people don't make it past page five of the Kama Sutra. We just, we just hover around our entire not, life. Not without chiropractic care. That's right. Page <laughs> Yeah. Page five. I mean, who wants to do wheelbarrows, guys, and jackhammers? I don't want to do that. Yeah, yeah. The voice you hear before we get introduce him is not David Letterman, although he sounds like <laughs> he does sound like David Letterman. He uh-huh. is so, he is so fired up and ready to do this interview, and I can appreciate it so much. But Jim, today's guest, extraordinary bass player, internationally acclaimed bass player, has been touring the world for forty years. He's even got a one man show that you know we're going to get into that. But thirty four of those years have been with one of the most popular recording artists of all time, Mr. Kenny G. And today's guest is our friend Vale Johnson. Hey, hey, hey. How you doing, buddy? Doing good, doing good. He's, he's, got, his, he's got his bass. He's, yeah. you know, you, you can tell he's a creative soul because his, his, his walls are orange and he's yes. got a bunch of platinum records up. He's all ready to do this thing. Man, we have played together um, because you were an Angelino for many years and now for the last, what, seven, eight years you've been in Nashville? Been 10 years. 10 years already. 10 years now, yeah. Yeah. And uh, when was the God, when was the last time we? I know that I played something with you on one of your solo records, but I can't remember. Yeah, yeah, Which, you, yeah you came you came over here and played uh, on um, uh, something. I can't remember. <laughs> I think it was uh, that was song it? with the tones in it. It was yes. a song. It, it had the bass and the beats and the dun 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 bum bum bum. You know, and that stuff. It, it yeah. had that and stuff. A couple it, of tom toms. It had some yeah, rhythmic was, figures. I, yeah, I think uh, I've you know I've totally forgotten which. Oh, one. I know the the Color. latest thing that we did together is that I put out that product drumming in the modern world, and we had a song called "Be Love" that oh. um, our guitar tech in the band wrote this great song, and you came in and played fretless on it. Yeah. Amazing! Yeah. Thank you fun. again for doing that. So we yeah. we've been impacting some lives with that for the last five years, which is really cool. Um, but let's get into like you know, there's going to be so much to talk about. You're so talented. You've been around the world. These are just a few of the people that you've played with: Herbie Hancock, Stevie Nicks, Kebmo, George Benson, Michael Bolton, James Ingram. MC Hammer, there's a story there, I'm sure, Steve Perry, and then David Cassidy, Eric Marienthal, Patty Austin, Warren Hill, we're, you know, Freddie Ravel, Edgar Winter, Carmine, my buddy Carmine, I love that. Yeah, yeah. But your home base as a musician, it is so, one of the goals is to get a gig and keep a gig, you know, keep the lights on, live the American dream, buy a home from your talent, the house that bass built. 34 years with Kenny G. How did that all start, man? Tell us, take us back. Oh, man. I was, uh, well, listen, I grew up in Seattle. Yeah. And Kenny is the Seattle guy. And and his connection that we talked about before with Jeff Lorber. Jeff Lorber's a Portland guy. But uh, so he, so there's kind of the Seattle, Portland, sort of a little go between. Uh, but anyway, yeah, I was, I had been playing uh, for a living, doing, doing the, uh, and back then in the, in the mid, late 70s and, in the early '80s, you could make a living playing, playing, uh, you know, in, in lounges. Yeah, like every hotel had a lounge and Holiday a, Inns. Yeah, you know, ho- I played so many Holiday Inns, and it was, you know, six nights a week, four sets a night, and you could make a living doing that. So I, I had been doing that for like ten years. Yeah, and I and I'd met uh, I met Kenny through a mutual friend, a guy named Tony Gable, who played percussion with him. 
And this is, and you, and I know that you'll have similar stories. We all, we all do. You always get these connections from the places you least expect it. Yeah. And you know, which, which mean, which brings me to a lot of other things that we can talk about later. But, Please. But mm. uh, yeah, so uh, the percussionist, Tony Gable came to this sleazy blues bar uh, in Seattle where I was playing with an admittedly really good blues band. And uh, he came and saw me, really dug what I was doing. He told Kenny about it. Kenny came and saw me the next weekend that I never, I'd never met him. I really didn't know much about the music either because I, I was more of a hard rock guy. I was, yeah. a, I was Zeppelin all the way. Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, yes, I was that. That was my thing. Did you have some hair like down to your back, the middle of your back kind of thing? Yeah, no, it was never quite that long, you know? Gotcha. Now I have hair down the middle of my back, but, but it's not coming. It's on my, your back. It's, growing up, <laughs> yeah. it's coming up from my ankles. <laughs> so my ankles all the way up to my neck now. Anyway, that's, that's a whole different thing. But no, so I met, Kenny came, saw me play, asked me to come and join in the, uh, the group and and that was in uh you know spring of 86 i that is unbelievable and in the early days when he was developing i mean obviously there's, there's that history with clive davis right there was like yeah. i think there's oh, yeah. something there and and uh I you young, know i needed the money i mean how do you get to selling 80 million records as an instrumental artist that's like such a unique thing oh it's cracking that whip could be the, could be the only one ever that will ever do that because right what else is, you know, the, the landscape now has changed so much that who knows if there'll ever be anybody with instrumentals that'll sell any records hard. I know. It's just not the thing. But, yo, no, he's a, he just struck a nerve right then. Clive was obviously a big part of, of making that happen. What are the early gigs, though? Are you playing, like, listening rooms, and then all of a sudden there was a transformation where you guys are playing, like, 10,000, 15,000 seaters? It was kind of almost like that. I'm playing – the first gigs with them were playing, you know – big bars, you know, <laughs> you know, playing like, uh, I don't know if you've been to the coach house in San Juan Capistrano. Sure. Like, yeah. Thousand seat, 800 seat, stuff like yeah. that, you know, and, uh, and small theaters like, uh, is it Masiba theater in Dallas? I think. Mm. Masiba, is that how you pronounce it? Masiba. Masiba. I don't, I don't know if I ever saw that one, but I saw you at the caravan of dreams. Yeah. Yeah. But so, so we're doing stuff like that. Yeah. <clears throat> and then we get, uh, he we get uh playboy jazz festival nice. and of course now that's eighteen thousand people you know and we're uh, naked in, in the amphitheater and, and and that was just the breakout thing <clears throat> and uh shortly after that get on to uh uh tonight's show with johnny carson back then yes and uh playing songbird and 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 that was uh that was it and it was just off to the races from there it did kenny really make nice. it to the couch did he make it to the couch over there with uh carson not on that. Not on that first one. Yeah. Not on that first one. But but he did when we went back. You know. Yeah. We, we did it on it six seven times probably. You know, and and uh, he did get he did get over there. And how has the show progressed over the years? Has it changed? I mean, because I've seen you guys like five feet off to the side at the Ryman, thanks to our good buddy Bobby Mertz. Um, and I'm, I'm sitting there with a glass of wine in my hand just watching you guys do your thing. Everybody in the band gets a beautiful solo, great interaction, dynamics, great musicianship. He's great with the audience. Uh, it was very enjoyable, man. Very enjoyable. Yeah, thanks, thanks. It's been well, you know, it was it was much more of a funk band when when we started. Yeah, it was all it was like funk R and B. In fact, his first hits, you know, on uh, on his albums on on Arista were all R and B vocal tunes, and he doesn't sing. We had had a singer like you know Lenny Williams sang some mm. tunes, you know, on. But so we had a, we had a guy a, a, a singer played some like auxiliary keyboards, but we had a singer, a lead singer, and I, and I sang the background on that. Nice. And so it was it was all. I mean, f for the longest time, people thought Kenny was a black singer. Wow. When people would come to a show, because that's what they heard on the radio. Yeah. They heard the, and they heard this and this like with some some great sax playing, but it's basically R and B vocal tunes, you know. And so <laughs> we'd we'd. Uh, it was it was all a funk band. As soon as Songbird hit, then you know things started shifting over to oh man, they I mean that was a phenomenon. Everybody loved that song back. I in saw you uh, watch some footage of you guys doing it on the Arsenio Hall show. Yeah, yeah. And I don't oh, know who the drummer was, but the cymbals were like it was like the eighties. It was like that was, yeah, that was the, yeah. the original drummer. Yeah, uh, Kenny McDougal. Yeah. What's Ken, is Kenny? Is he doing all right? Is he? What's he doing? Oh, I have no idea. He, they haven't he, kept in touch with him. He, he split. He split with bad blood. 
Uh, oh, really? And now there was another drummer, God rest his soul, I believe he passed. There was a, gi- a giant. He was a big yeah. man. Yeah, yeah. Bruce Carter, who was, yeah, he was, the, he was the best for me. We had a, we had a communication between us, you know, unspoken thing just from the first time we played together. It was really I, cool. I love that. I saw some, uh, some footage of an old clinic you guys did at MI yeah. together. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Super that was cool. all just stream of consciousness stuff. We, we didn't work anything out. That's I just great. start playing and he would play and then we just eventually end and start something else. <laughs> yeah. It was fun. Wow, man. Yeah. And I mean, I, I enjoyed the heck out of it. And so in between, you know, you're a workaholic. So you're like, you told me that there was years of your life, 40 years you've been touring the world where you would just not be home. Right. So in the cracks, you'd go out with Herbie Hancock or Edgar Winter. Any fun mm-hmm. stories there? Oh man. You know, it's, there's a lot of fun stories that are all sort of, bound by the bro code that uh, you can't you can't most yeah. of those but uh man it was just really the most fun thing for me really was just the experience of being with playing with so many different groups different yeah. kinds of people you know and it's just really fun so p- people say well, don't you go crazy doing the same gig you know for 34 years but that's like that's i have done that for that length of time all the kenny stuff but there's been so many other things that that uh when we go back on on a Kenny tour, it seems kind of fresh because I've already shifted off and done all this other stuff. Yeah, so I, I it's like really that. Just the, the, you know, the traveling with all, all kinds of different personalities, I find it really interesting, you know, and it, it's not necessarily always fun, yeah. but it's always interesting. You know, if you're, if you're paying attention, you know, people are kind of infinitely interesting once you get past <laughs> some of the superficial things, you know, because sure. you know, it's like you're on the road. I mean, you're essentially you're living with these guys. You know, oh yeah, my band. You know, we're looking at twenty-one years together, and so it's yeah. like an unspoken thing where we see each other more than our families, and we finish yeah. each other's senses, and it's a great thing. And then everybody goes in the little breaks and cheats on each other, and writes songs with other people, or plays in other yeah, sessions. Right. <laughs> and then you come back, and it's like, oh, this is so good. Let's bring this new, fresh perspective to this material. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it's good. It's good to have a short memory too. <laughs> Uh, you, me- you mentioned, I, I remember listening to another podcast where you said you were doing some sort of a gig with Kenny at the Universal Amphitheater, which of course is now a parking lot in Los Angeles. Yeah, yeah, well, um, we played one of the last shows the there. Parking lot, yeah, a lot more money. It's a parking lot. Um, and you're playing and then you, you hear a tambourine, you look around, Stevie Nicks is on stage shaking a tambourine with you. You make a connection in the most organic way. Next thing you know, you're playing on a Stevie Nicks record. Am I, is yeah. that right? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's right. Yeah, we're, we're doing the gig. And it's it's at the end of the show when Kenny would walk around the, uh, the house, you know, with his wireless and and the, you know we're back in the '80s and '90s, walking around with a wireless was pretty cool because not everybody had that, you know. Yeah. And so so every night though, and no matter how big the arena, if it's a fifteen thousand seat arena, he would go at least on one concourse, go the entire way around. And so it could be twenty five thirty minutes we vamp on one song. Yeah. Uh, and so he, he's out in the audience, and we just start. Essentially, we're just goofing off. Yeah. And at that time, we're just, we're entertaining ourselves because everybody's looking at him. You know, everybody in the very front, they're all turned around and looking at Kenny. So we're just goofing <laughs> off, you know, and having fun and, and whatever. So, so we're, we're doing the vamp and we're playing, you know, it's like. Just doing this for a, like a day. And, and I hear this weird jingling sound behind me to my left, like right here. And uh, I thought, I'm thinking, okay, that's really weird because the percussionist is right here. And I hear him playing. He didn't go anywhere. Drummer's right there. So I turn around, and and Stevie had gone up to uh, the percussion riser, stolen a tambourine, and is playing it, and I'm just twirling, doing her her, her whirling dervish thing yes. back there, and playing tambourine. And I'm like, all right, you, you never know what's yeah. going to happen in L.A. <laughs> yeah, that's that's out there, you know. And One so, of you guys didn't think to say, hey, hey, <laughs> hey, <laughs> the girl, no, girl, the girl, no girl, girls in the this, band. Uh, there's no oh, yeah. girls in this band. <laughs> Ruby yeah, so, on the and, stage, and then, huh? And then talk to her after afterwards. And uh, man, I got a lot of gigs from the backstage of the Universal Amphitheater. I mean, that's how I hooked up with Arsenio, you know, too. And that was and Paula Abdul. I hooked up with her there and, and did did her record. And so, yeah. And so, we, yeah, we met, did the record, and and had a great time. And, and there so, it is. Arsenio, did you were at one point were you in his band? No, I was uh, I was a guest. I was the music guest. Oh, you would be a guest a lot because he I just. I think Arsenio just loves bass. Does he not? He well, he he sure said so. Yeah, yeah I mean, because yeah. I've seen footage where he's like, 
you know, invites you out. You were heavily featured with that band. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I was, I was, I came on as the musical guest for that show. Nice. You know, so like, you know, we got Kenny. I played there with Kenny a bunch of times as the musical guest, but it was, you know, I was, it was really cool. He had me as the guy. So that, you know, so I had a lot of time. I had a lot of airtime to, to play, and it was a lot of fun. Yeah, good exposure I there. That, I did that a number of times. Yeah. I remember, remember you telling me when you were done with Los Angeles, you were like, something happened on your front lawn and you're like, I am out of here. There was a transitory moment. Oh yeah. 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 The, uh, the freshly stabbed bleeding, uh, gang member <laughs> passing out in my yard <laughs> was, was, uh, that was a moment that, that really spoke to me. Yeah. What <laughs> neighborhood was that? That in Woodland Hills. In Woodland Hills. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's a nice neighborhood, man. It you know, is a nice neighborhood. A nice place. Yeah. And, and, but man, crazy stuff was happening all over the place. So it, it happened while I'm, you know, while I'm, I'm, you know, calling the police and, and, and putting pressure on his wound, had him lay down there and blood all over my sidewalk. And, and, and uh, he was okay. They, they got him, but he had just gotten, he just got gutted, you know, poor guy. Oh, somebody. And, uh, and I thought, Somewhere else is where I need to be. <laughs> so tell us about your relationship with Music City. It, was a, it feels like it was a great choice for you. You're always so busy. And in recent years, you've been playing with Keb Moe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Why did, I, Keb, Keb, well, Kevin, this is really, Kevin yeah. and I moved out of L.A. at the same time, but we oh. never knew each other in L.A. Wow. You know? And I think he was living in uh, Century City, I think. And yeah, we both, but through a mutual friend, uh, Terry Woolman, he uh, he introduced us uh, out here, yeah. and hooked up with him. And I played on some of the records that he was of his own records and some stuff he was producing. And and it was another one of those things where I you know I told him I said, look, I've got these chunks of time where Kenny's not going out. You yeah. Know, if you're going out, you know, let me know. I'll come and do it. And and I did like I did like three years where things just dovetailed perfectly. Oh, isn't it amazing? Oh, it was yeah. so cool. And then once there was a conflict, then, you know, nobody's happy. Nobody's so, happy. But yeah, did you yeah. guys, when you were playing live, did you ever do the theme song to Mike and Molly? That dum, yeah, da, 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 yeah, yeah. I yeah. like that one. <laughs> yeah, My, yeah. You know, Jim knows how much of a fan I am of the sitcom. Uh, Mike oh, and Molly, okay. <laughs> really good one. Really good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and he wrote the theme oh, yeah. song. We, all, we would always do that. Everybody loved that song, you know. All the heavy set ladies out in the... I seem to love that. When they want to get up. <laughs> now you were talking about like kind of serendipity and like how one thing leads to the other and the, the way you got gigs. You were we mentioned that. Did you want to kind of expand yeah. on that a little bit? Because I know that some of the up and coming musicians in the audience will love to hear those kind of stories. Well, it's been my experience, and everyone I've talked to, it's it that has has come across. You know, it ended up doing a lot of different gigs. The way you get them, it's, it's always, you can make these connections in places you don't expect. And for me, it's been literally every time it's been where I didn't expect it. And I've gotten zero out of conscious networking. Yes. Throughout my career, nothing, zero. As far as like an immediate, you know, traceable, you know. Contact tracing. Contact from that, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's, there might've been some, some sort of tertiary benefit down the road somewhere else but my conscious clever insightful and witty networking has gotten me crap yeah so i basically quit doing that right oh it's worked out great what for you the gigs is to do a crap load of gigs and just have people see you that's your business and, card. You, and you meet people on your gigs and that's the thing it's like i got i got a good one for you that comes in the and this is what i taught when i do my when i do clinics yeah, I'm telling, and people are saying, "Well, how do you get, how do you, how do you get into the business? You know, I want to do it." And and my, it's different for everybody, but there are certain things, there are certain parallels, and the the concept of doing your best every second of every minute of every show you ever do, yes, is is foreign to a lot of guys. What? It. So they're and, like, I can't mail it in occasionally. Wait, 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 wait. wait. And in I'm Nashville, supposed to be doing my best. Nashville is worse than LA as far as as far as the laissez-faire <laughs> attitude to a, a, a gig I, I would try to counsel some of these younger players and they're like yeah well I was gonna go do this gig well you know, do, do they have a drum set there yeah, I, oh, yeah. I like to load my drums and I'm thinking 
man, you're 20 years old. Get loaded. You're complaining about loading drums. Yeah. It's like, I can't that be a good thing? <laughs> Meaning that it's I remember, easier to remember, rise to the top. I know? remember carrying B3 <clears throat> and, and uh, Leslie's up narrow stairs to get to a second story. It's called That's Le why I had a hernia operation Le from the damn Le B3. Cafe in L Le Cafe in LA. Yeah. It was a great place to play. And I remember playing with this maniac that had to have his B3 and, and two Leslie's. And this room, the top level seated like 30 people, you know. Right. But I mean, we would do that. And I never thought about, oh, man, no, I'm not. No, I can't go up the stairs. Yeah. You have stairs. Don't you have but an But do you escalator? still have that attitude now? Would you still haul a, uh, an organ up a staircase? Yep. Absolutely. Really? Great question, Jim. Long. Yeah. I got my, I got my, I've got the heaviest gear you can buy. When right. people now, the, the bass players are the biggest wimps in the universe. They all complain about the weight of their equipment. It's yeah, like, I hurt the oh, fingers. this head, I can't bring this head. And now they have these little, these class D amplifiers, these little tiny ones. That's, oh, well, I got this head. It weighs 3.2 pounds. All right, what are you like for the gearheads? Are you like a heart key guy or what are you? No, no. What? what? Tell us what you play. Why, freaking SVT, baby. Come on, all right, baby. All right. Yeah. I knew it. Yeah, I got 80 pound head. A couple of eight tens. Yep. Yeah. And that's what sure. you do. Now, when you're saying a laissez-faire laissez attitude, like a la lackadaisical mm. attitude, is that, is that towards the, like, well, is there a house kid? Is Millennium. there catering? What is there, like, how many songs do I have to learn? Or is it the level of preparation? Because in my, in my experience, I feel like, and this could be just because of the things I've experienced, but I feel like the level of preparation for a lot of the musicians in Nashville is pretty good. I don't show up on a lot of gigs where guys – didn't learn anything you know what i mean yeah but you're on a whole different level so maybe the talent that is attracting to your ecosystem is up on a certain level you know whereas where is the just, yeah you're in the entry level positions you're not in touch with anymore well the that guys that are coming up should <clears throat> be working 10 times as hard to make sure that they're crossing their t's and dotting their eyes because right. i they do have be, some and they don't yeah. want to and they don't right. want that's, to. That's the point he's making. But uh, yeah. okay, the, thank, the you, young thank you for translating, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a good yeah. thing because if everybody around you is already doing that, then it means you're probably doing the right thing too. Ah, you know, your great oh. players are going to you know coexist in the same ecosystem. Yeah, what I would try to help, but but the the tie in what I'm getting to is one of one of the coolest opportunities and turned out to be a great paying uh, situation was I was doing this terrible gig in Crenshaw in LA. Right. Which is, it's in the middle of the, the crap. It's serious Stop. down there. Chinese restaurant right next to a, a stop and rob liquor store yeah. that I think was robbed every night we played. And, and. Uh, a stop and rob. A stop and rob. I have one of those across <laughs> from my house in Nashville. Man, this place was horrible. Mm -hmm. And the sax player was a guy that everybody joked about hating playing with but for but he was one of those guys that got gigs yeah and so he'd call you up and it's like you want to go make a hundred bucks and i'm like yeah sure let's go do that we'll do a gig and this is after this is you know i've been on the road with kenny for 10 15 years already but people call That's me for a gig and i and i just <clears throat> do them Good for I, you, I play gigs for free still anyway sure. so at this chinese That's, restaurant you know, chinese restaurant yeah. i got to there's like four people out there the sack the leader is terrible this would be the perfect opportunity to just have a, just be, oh, okay, I'm just going to get through it. All right. Yeah, you know. But I can't do that. No. I can never do that. And the strangest thing happened. I go meet these guys that call the Wojan brothers. I, the, there's these three guys sitting at a table, and they, put, they pulled me over, and they said, they said, hey, man, do you do, uh, you know, I love what you're doing. Do, do you do session work? And I said, yeah, sure. And you always get people asking stuff like that, and most of the time nothing happens but these guys called me up and it turns out that they're one of the big uh movie tv soundtrack oh, wow. guys they do they do almost all the trailers for movies damn they, they don't yeah. do the movies but the trailers and there's money in that oh sure oh yeah and are so you still working doing, with them at, at all oh they're in la so that okay, all, okay. That uh, all went gotcha. away you know but but man so it turns out and it's all from this stupid Chinese restaurant gig with a terrible player, but I couldn't not do my best and be into it. And that's a perfect example. 
th this turned out to, I mean, I was getting mailbox money for years and years after I stopped working with them. Yeah. It's, that's the thing. You never know. You All never questions. know. Like the thing with Kenny, with that percussionist coming and seeing me play randomly, you know, all of my <clears throat> connections have come from someplace I never expected. But the, the common denominator is that I've always played 100%. Yes. But do you and get still do. some of your, your peers coming after you by saying, by the way, do, how do I sound rich? Do I sound like I'm muddy again? You sound a little, little muddy. Cool? Yeah. It's not, yeah. You don't do sound I? like yourself, but it's okay. No, it's not okay. You're such a nice um, guy. It's okay. You have pink in your mouth or something? What? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, oh, people no, are no. people are attracted it's to positive. Pocket. They're attracted to en to enthusiasm and positivity, and the enthusiasm is contagious. Yeah. And they can tell the level of preparation. And they can tell the level of your of your uh, enthusiasm. Yeah, being there, you know, yeah. and prepared. Yeah, because yeah, I mean, like with you, Rich, you're, you're a pretty sleepy guy when you're playing. <laughs> you know, you look, you look bored most of the time. Yeah. yeah. Hardly ever any energy. <laughs> that's that's a, interesting that you should say that. Do you have your comrades, your peers in the base circles, you know, look at you and say, hey, you know, you're driving down the industry. It's a race to the bottom. You're a bottom feeder because you'll take any gig and get paid anything and you could command more. Because, I mean, that happens in the voiceover world yeah. all the time. Oh, okay. A lot of the legacy you know, generational voiceover talent are complaining about the new people coming on board and going to all the pay to play sites like voices.com uh, yeah. and voice one, two, three, and they audition all day long for $200 jobs. Um, and they're basically, you know, going after the newbies because they don't know how to price themselves. But at the same time, mm, yeah. it enabled me to come up with my philosophy of hamburger versus steak clients. Yeah. You know, sure. Kenny, is your steak client. It's, it's, yeah. it's, you know, everything you've aspired for. But the hamburger clients are, are valuable too. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things I always espouse. I'm like, don't, don't discount the hamburger clients. Right? You, get to work your cli you get to work your craft with the, with the hamburger exactly. clients and you never know what it's going to lead to. Right. You, know, you never know exactly. who's going to be in the audience. They're going to get experience working with you, become a flaming advocate of you. And, and this is something I got from you, Rich. Nobody wants to stay where they are. They all want to move up. Yeah. So if all of a sudden you become endeared to them and they're a, they're a champion of you, you go with them, you know, and it's just, why wouldn't you do it? Yeah. Yeah. And it's just, it's just, just do it. I mean, if they want to have you, then do it. You know, well, you're trying to upsell them. I mean, obviously I would, I would it's sure, it's sure, it's sure worked for Vale. So I don't think any of your colleagues, I don't think, I don't see any one saying anything bad about Vale because you could tell that he's passionate about his instrument and the fact that he does go out and play for free. And, and, and you have so much knowledge and insight to share. I mean, I could see you doing a million clinics, even having, you know, Tim Pierce has an online guitar school right now and he's like, okay killing it oh, yeah. because, you know because i don't think he likes to tour i don't think he ever did and then right, you know right. the session work is like with every you know every week passing week a major recording studio is closing so he's sure. like I'll, I'll get into education i mean i could see you doing something like that i could see you writing a memoir um but right along the lines of that you said i'm gonna do a one-man show yeah that's what yeah, i want to come and i know there was just one did i just miss it in nashville you just, did you just, you just missed one yeah it was yeah. Uh, last saturday but Nice. The uh, Mockingbird Theater. Gotta go check. Where where was it? At the Mockingbird Theater. Where is that? It's a, it's in the factory. Oh, nice. Yeah. Nice. And so, how was it with happening the seventy again. seat little theater? It's really nice. Nice. Huh? It was good. That's that, what I'm doing. I yeah, think so that's people, the one. I'm sorry, Jim. That's the one you played in, Rich. The Mockingbird Theater. That was the one you did the crash course in for uh, Carrie M, I believe. Oh. So the, seating, the seating goes up really steep. Yeah. Right. Yes. That's mm -hmm. the one, yeah. That is a nice theater. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Well, tell us about that because I, I want to do something like that down the line where you play, I'm going to play multiple characters. Like, I'll be my dad. I'll be my mom. It'll be like a thing, you know? <laughs> Richie, <laughs> it's Thanksgiving. Come stop practicing. Right, right. Well, you got to do costume changes if you really Costume changes and everything. Yeah, yeah. 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 No, that's what I... My idea for this, uh, my friend Doak Turner gave me the name, Around the World in 40 Doak. Years. That's great. We love Doak. Doak yeah. 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 And so we, that's, people ask me about, you know, wanting to do a video or writing a book and things like that. And it, that doesn't really, doesn't really grab me because yeah. I just love performing. Sure. And so what I decided to do is I was going to take all of these experiences of all these different artists and... Uh, the stories that revolve around, you know, our meeting and 
something else. I mean, a lot of this is just, it's just off the cuff. I have a rough outline, but there's so many, I can only pack a, a small percentage of it into a 90 minute show, you know, so every show is going to be different. But uh, basically I'm talking about, I'll, I'll tell that story about how I met Stevie Nicks, for example, and then I'll play as a song that I did with her. That's awesome. And, and, and I yeah. do it, I do it kind of, uh, I, it's like uh, I, I was inspired by Ed Sheeran, the way that he does his looper when he does his solo thing. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if you've seen it. He's fantastic at that. And so He's really good I it. tell people I'm kind of like a male version of Ed Sheeran. Where, <laughs> where I do, it's just a, and I do it on bass and with a little <clears> more <throat> testosterone. And, mm -hmm. and <laughs> but uh, so that's what I came up with. And people seem to be really enjoying it. And so I, so I go throughout my career and do a, do tunes, you know, yeah. it's like, like if I was doing like, and I, I haven't set up my looper and I don't, I don't, I don't create all the loops right then. Cause that's just too laborious and it's just too time consuming for it's the, too looperious. Yes. Oh it my is. God. So I, I do have them. I, I set up the loops, you know, before and, you know, have them in my little boss RC 300 is pretty cool three channel looper. And so I can do, you know, verses, choruses, bridge and all that, but I you do just it step, all, You just all step on it and there's the new section. Boom. All the sounds are from this bass though. Oh, wow. It's there's crazy. No sense. There's no nothing. It's all from here. And, uh, but I, I emulate drum kits and I emulate guitars, keyboards, whatever, and do all those things, you know, I love that. So, that, so you can so do like it. Tom, so Tom sounds. I'm sorry. You can do Tom, Tom sounds and things like that on the bass. I can. Yeah, I, I can do it. I can, I can do, uh, you know, I can do uh, congas, you know, like. You know, nice. I, uh, a lot of just, you, know, you know, and I'll set that stuff up anyway. But like the Stevie Nicks thing, you know, it's like like I'll do. Uh, I, I like doing the chain. It's really the oh yeah. <laughs> You know, but I'll have it with the loop Beautiful. that has all the drums and all that stuff, you know. So I, I do that, and then I'll uh, bring up somebody else. I might talk about David Cassidy. You yeah, know, you were his band leader for a while, weren't you? Yeah, yeah, I was for a few years. His, his first, his initial comeback yeah. in the uh, mid-90s, uh, mid I guess. Early, early, uh, mid-90s. And uh, yeah, so I was the music director, and we did a bunch of TV shows and some live gigs, and that was nice. Fun. But I'll talk about that, and then I'll talk about doing a gig with, uh, you know, doing that tour, which you saw, was, but I don't know if he was there. A Gil Scott Heron, I don't know if he showed up on that. Yeah, it was. The, it was like a GRP super band or something, yeah. and it was yeah. a Terry Lynn Carrington on drums. Yeah, and you the guys, I believe, right? opened exactly. for the Rippingtons, or it was a double bill, or was no. Would that no, be great? Yeah. That was a different gig? We, okay, yeah. That was something else, yeah. The Rich Redmond Show will be right back. Henry Ford once said that if you need a machine and don't buy it, then you will ultimately find that you have paid for it and don't have it. Nothing could be truer about energy-efficient LED lighting in your business. At Big Dot Lighting, we can show you how a portion of your savings from a commercial LED lighting upgrade will be paid for in hardly any time at all. Until then, you're paying for them anyway. Book a no-cost lighting energy assessment with Big Dot Lighting. At least 30% of your utility bill is waiting to be saved. Go to BigDotLighting.com. This is the Rich Redman Show. Are the Rippingtons still around? I remember? have no idea. Okay. I have no idea. I just remember a period of my life where it was like smooth jazz, baby. I, I'm on Warren Hill, all this. Stuff. I'm going to move. I'm going to get my, my hammer pants and my color, my chess king shirt. And I'm, nice. I'm going to do that thing. And it never happened. I moved to Nashville. <laughs> you know? Yeah. No, so, so you were going to do smooth, smooth jazz? I loved I really enjoy smooth jazz. I really do. Well, there's footage of you playing some pretty serious fusion music. I remember seeing somewhere maybe on MySpace. Yeah, I mean, Vail, Vail will get the call. I want, also on the bucket list is I want to do a nice little 10-track Fusac solo record, you know, where I, I co-pen all the songs and I, and I invite and cast my favorite musicians that are perfect for each track on there, and I'll release it, and it'll sell cardboard, and, but it'll be amazing. Yeah. Be <laughs> but if, if you get somebody who doesn't know what they do, they're doing on it, it might sell, like me. <laughs> oh yeah, we'll do, we'll have you come in and play congas, buddy. 
Uh, we can do a Christopher Walken impersonation in between each track, introducing each track. Nice. Oh my God, that might be fun. Yeah. Kind of a nice and Vale, Vale, Vale doing a uh, you know David Letterman impersonation, dude. Yeah. I mean, you have an uncanny <laughs> sound to David Letterman. It's amazing. Oh, man. That, I'm not. I'm not I'm hearing not, that. You you have such a great baritone. <laughs> That's my you know, uh, voiceover should be part of your offerings for sure. Right, right. Yeah, I've, 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 uh, I've, I've often thought about that, but I know it's going to be, it'd be just as hard as trying to break into the music business and initially. So I was like, yeah, do I really need to go through all that again? Exactly. Like, I think many, with, with, how many with the amount of people do I have to sleep with to get some good voiceover? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, with the amount of, with the circle of friends that you have, you could probably find a way to get some sort of voicing gig. It happened with Greg Bissonette. Yeah, Greg Bissonette's the uh, is Winnie the Pooh now. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? I did not know that. I know. Yep, it's That's crazy. Wild. Dang. But Greg shared with us that the voiceover industry is so cutthroat. You will never get a thank you or thanks for stopping by. Um, whereas the music business, for the most part, there are some gentlemen still left in the business. Sure. Sure. Um, so, are you doing t any teaching on a regular basis, where you're mentoring young kids or? Uh, online I, teaching or anything every, every now and then i yeah. i keep thinking okay let me try this again yeah and then to end up getting uh, frustrated uh because they're not practicing dealing with people yeah you know and, man you know the right student i've had some students where it, it really everything th things click yeah and you feel like you're really helping and and that's great and i love that but so many times i get I get people where it's just now it's just like you're it's like like button heads with somebody you're trying to help yeah and, and especially with the younger guys and i had some bad things bad times here in nashville with some super talented young kids that that you know parents were paying me to try to help them put a band together and sort of mentor them like that and that all just imploded they just turned just little brats <laughs> <laughs> 14, 15 year old, you know, guys that are it's like, damn, these guys sound great. Way better than I did when I was that age. Yeah. I, I find that as well. Like looking I, back, I, like, wow. I finally, yeah. And I finally ended up having to tell him, I said, look, man, you're super talented. You're never going to have a music career with that attitude. It's just never going to happen because you need people on your side. Yes. You know, yeah. and, and talent alone won't cut it. No. It never does. It yeah. never does. Can you have can you have a good attitude, a great attitude with eh talent and get by? It's happened. Oh well, <laughs> most, I'd say most of the people in the music industry are not particularly talented. Yeah, right. De you know, depending on your definition of talent, I mean, is and then and then the ones that are super talented that have the attitude to go with it, then they just end up being you know, bitter former Berkeley uh, music professors that uh, end up in the clock tower with a high powered rifle and <laughs> taking pot shots at people. Yeah, you know? that's not good. <laughs> or trying to remain relevant. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> the fight it, for relevance. Funny. Yeah. Yeah. No, uh, that, in radio, it's a big part. It's a big <clears throat> part of it, man. You guys, as, as you know, yeah. and I, how do you, Rich and Jim, how do you get that through to people so they really understand it? Because it's such a cliche in a lot I don't of know ways, if you can. but they, how did you, you I just know. can't beat it into them? No. One of my I mean, favorite quotes. Yeah, they kind of have to figure it out themselves, I believe. Like along the way, they'll make mistakes. Hopefully, they won't make so many mistakes right. and burn so many bridges that they can't come back from it. Right. You have to be, in order to really shift somebody's mindset on stuff like that, you have to be almost like a father figure mentor. So, investing a lot of time into them as if they're a child and say, no. How about electric shock? <laughs> electric shock therapy. <laughs> That's another way. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great quote. And I don't know who came up with it, but obviously I didn't, but I love this. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him thirsty. Wow. Do on that one for a while. Yeah.
Yeah, it's like hunger. It's like the, the, the <laughs> like if we if we talk about the crash concept, you know, committing. It's obviously you committed to your craft for so long. Along the way, you cultivated these amazing relationships. You, re- you realize the power of attitude. You're still developing your skill, but what you brought to the table from the very beginning was that hunger, that fire in your belly to be successful. And you're always going to have that, and you're always going to be stoking those flames. And that's why you work all the time. That's why I like people like being in a room with you. That's that's why you'll always be relevant. And so I think that if there's somebody that's picking up a base out there, you're someone to aspire to, someone to, uh, they, they should be picking your brain, you know, because you got it all covered. I mean, you can walk that thing, you know, you can walk it like bebop it all day long. You could slap it. You can get down and play a, a and you could play a three chord country song if you need to live or in the studio. You got all the bases co- covered, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? I think I love, I just love music. Yeah. Is a big part of it. I don't love bass. Yeah. You I, like how the bass fits love, into music. I, yeah. I love, I love, I just, I just love music. Yeah. You know, and so, so it's not, it's not bass centric. It's just, it's music. We, yeah. It's a, it's a big thing for me. You know? Yeah, and for sure. A lot of, and I picked up a bunch of cool things from, from uh, working with Kev and I started working with him when I moved here, you know, 10 years ago. And, and I picked up uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of different um, like finger style picking things yeah. from him. And I, and I, I thought, man, he does that so well. He does a solo thing, just him and he's singing and it's so cool. But, uh, but so I'm still learning. I'm still trying to figure stuff out. Like, sure. like this thing here, like a, like a, doing that stuff on bass you know it's just, nice it's, why not yeah hey, let else. me ask you so, this so to me it's just music it's not sure yeah underrated yeah. bass players that come to mind yeah way underrated bass players who comes to mind first one what do you think Vale? me <laughs> <laughs> yeah because we always talk about alex van halen you know god rest his soul I, I his brother you know might- Michael Anthony comes to mind. Ah. Yeah. Well, there was so much uh, talent in that band. You got a crazy front man. You got the two brothers. You got a wacky, yeah. gu- you know, groundbreaking guitarist at the mm-hmm. edge of the stage. And he's just like, I'm cool. I'm back here. I'm Whatever. the glue. You know? Fail's still pondering yeah, the question. Yeah, get the right guy. Who comes to mind? Like, yeah, like who is due a lot more exposure than, he, than they get. Oh, I stumped him. Ooh, I if we had a press roll. Wow. Yeah, that's a that's a tough one. Because I don't I've, I don't you know I don't I don't really like a lot of musicians you know for, for their music. I like a lot of people, but yeah, but <laughs> I couldn't tell you. Wow. Have no, underrated, oh, okay. probably all of them. Yeah. You know, it'd be easier to do. It'd be easier to list the overrated ones. Well, I mean, who is it? I always said like it'd be Neil way Peer. more way more fun, but. Yeah, Neil Peart is like the common man's drummer. Everybody knows who or knew who Neil Peart was, right? Right. Uh, you know, you, right. when when a common person thinks of a bass player, who are they going to think of? Are they thinking know? of Sting? Are they thinking of maybe? Is he but an they, artist or a bass player? Non I mean, musicians. Non musicians. I don't think think of Sting as as a bass player no. at all. I think they. Teddy Lee may come to mind. I mean, hmm, singer, you know. even uh, yeah, Les Claypool. Like I, I would have to say Tully Kennedy. Stuff. <laughs> I don't know anything about it. I really don't. Hey, Vale, do you want to play us a whole song? Would I you like to play us a song today? Oh man, you know I should have set up my looper and I didn't. Oh, but uh, but I could do, I could do a little bit of something of something. Let me do that. Yeah, if you're if you're if you're down for it and comfortable. I'm I'm so professional. I'm going to tune up because you care. Yeah, I may flavor it with a few. Bull whips. Yeah, but it might be latent. <laughs> I'll have to take that into consideration. How about um Night Court? Okay. 
How about, <laughs> no, and, if, and if you ask for the Seinfeld theme, I'm hanging up. That's right. That should answer your question about what do people think of when they think of bass? They think that the Seinfeld thing was played on bass. You know, that's. Yeah. <laughs> it was a MIDI controller. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was it was and it was and it was so funny it was they only had one sample they didn't even it wasn't even multiple samples you can tell one sample one note and then it's just that one note played in different with the pitches you know right. but it's not even like a multiple sampled thing it's boom, like, boom, boom, boom. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> well, the about, transition um, the transition yeah. themes that they did but, you know to break up the uh, show <laughs> were interesting yeah dump a dump a dump boom yeah how about uh, how about this one? Check this out. This is kind you of got fun. it. I'll just do a verse of this one because I like playing this. It's one of my favorite songs before, long before I moved to Nashville. I just love this tune. I am a lineman for the county, and I drive the main road, searching in the sun for another overload. I hear you singing in the wire I can hear you through the wine And the Wichita lineman Is still on the line right to the solo here and I need you more than And I want you for all time And the Wichita lineman Is still on the line Nice, man! Yeah. Yeah, see, I would, man, I would pay top dollar to come see that. You, you, and I Dave Pomeroy and Jeff Berlin should have like a trio night. That'd be amazing. Because yeah. Jeff came and came and we did a couple of tunes together when I did my show at the Nashville Jazz Workshop. Yeah, it was hilarious, man. I mean, it was it was half jokes, half music, and it was it was really fun. Nice. We, yeah, we did we did some we did some stuff, and we were actually thinking about going and doing a duo thing, and traveling around and doing that when everything shut down when know? covid hit we like we yeah, yeah we were thinking about doing that we had actually we were working up queen songs fat bottom and, girls as a bat well no we were doing bohemian rats oh Rhapsody, wow two bases and, and we were covering all the all the parts it was well don't let that get rusty i want to see that man, oh, man. yeah how, was, how you been handling this covid man what's your daily thing like what like uh has it been a good thing for you like reflection practice no, it's been a I bad thing. Know. It's the worst. <laughs> <laughs> it's the worst. I I have been mainly just for that. There's no no contact with people, and obviously I'm not I'm not working. Yeah, you know, hard. I'm not touring. You know, so no that is, it's that all of that's terrible terrible. So I I've decided to just and you like I'm sure you did too. You know, it's just we're just making the best of it. So yeah. Let's, I'm going to try to be as productive as I can be and, For sure. and still do that. But yeah, so I'm still playing. I mean, we were, you know, my wife and I, we're just still living the same with, that we were before. We haven't locked ourselves up. We haven't done yeah. any of that stuff. We A lot of couples it. are, uh, uh, you know, at their wits end are learning so much about each other because they're with yeah. each other 24 seven. Oh yeah. It's yeah. A, that's, I could, I could see how a lot of people would have, have a lot of trouble with that. Yeah, for someone like us, like you and I, like just like all these years of travel, when you get to be home with your, with your gal, with your love, it's like, well, my God, this is something as simple as making 
breakfast together and having our coffee and there's a palm tree. It's very fun, you know? No, that, that's, a, that's a great thing. And, yeah. and so we've, we've, done, we've done a lot of that. The really cool uh, couple bonding things that, uh, so we haven't gotten at each other's throats, you know. So we've Maybe you just need to come camping with us. <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't be weird. That, well, no, well, that brings me to the, what, the other thing that's helping a lot is that, you know, a couple years ago, I bought an RV for uh, our cat so that he could come with us when we, when we oh. travel. And I take that on the road and even on like some of the Kenny tours and I'll, and Denise will come with me and our cat Cornelius would come. And, uh, and so, so I'm, we're doing RV trips. We're going to go somewhere next week too. Just, That's awesome. Dude, so we're going down to uh, Tim's Ford. We're spending uh, Thanksgiving at Tim's Ford Lake. You should join us. I don't, where is that? I've, I've not heard That's, of that. It's uh, Tim's Ford Lake. I mean, it's right down by Winchester and everything. It's a great little campground on the lake. Oh, okay. We're going to go yeah. kayaking and all that fun right. stuff. Well, Jim, what are you going to do for like turkey and dressing and all that stuff? Like order in from Boston Market or something? What do you, what do, you do? Boston Market? Dude, I don't like, know. I'm just grabbing at straws, man. <laughs> uh, you know, we're probably going to prepare a lot of stuff ahead of time. Yeah. We're not going to roast a turkey out there. We'll probably maybe, you know, Courtney will make it ahead of time and heat it up over. I mean, it'll be smoked. We, we, we cook everything over a fire. It's awesome. Oh, yeah. But I mean, serious. If we ever get out and we, you know, spend, hang, hang for a night by the fire, I'll play uh, my djembe. Is it a djembe? No, a cajon. Yeah, Jim, has, Jim has plays drums, but then he said okay. he wanted to make money, so he got into voiceover. Okay. Yeah, nice <laughs> I'll but play tell, my cajon badly with you playing your bass really well. That would be right. great, guys. Now, tell me about Cornelius, because I'm a cat guy. I had Sassy right. the cat. I had Sassy the cat for like um, nine or 10 years, and she was so amazing, and she made it to 15, and that was five years ago, and I miss her terribly. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I can I can imagine. Yeah, Cornelius, sweet. Uh, Denise and I had never owned a, a pet together or, you know, taken care of a pet together. She's had cats before. I never did. I always thought that they were just these aloof yeah. creatures that came to you when they wanted something and then just went away. You know? Which is there's some truth to that. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But so we're looking because, uh, well, you've, you've seen where I live. You know, we're, we, I'm in the woods. Yeah. You know, it's like we're in town, but in the woods. And so people's animals go missing in our, in our neighborhood. Yeah. And um, we were we went to uh, went to the Williamson County Animal Shelter to look for our neighbor's cat, a little a small kitten that they, they would let outside, to see if it got picked up there. And so, we're not looking for an animal. We're not we're for us, you know. We just thought, well, let's go check. We'll do her a favor. And so we walk into the cat room, and they have ceiling high cages, you know, of, of these cats. Yeah. We walk into the room, and immediately out of you know the fifty cages where they're all just sleeping or looking really depressed. One cat went nuts. It was like, it's like trying to push his face through the, through the, the, <laughs> the, uh, the door there. And I'm like, what's going on with this guy? And he's just like, tails going crazy. And he's, and so I thought we, we take him outside to, to go, you know, play with him a little bit. Yeah. He jumps on my lap, puts paws on each shoulder, looks me right in the face and just goes, mouth. And I said, that's, that's it. our cat. Right. We got to have him. <laughs> and was, and Denise, Denise thought I was nuts. Yeah, because I'd never had a cat. I don't. This is, I don't know nothing from cats. We weren't looking to get a cat. Yeah, but that was it. And when I get up to walk away, he literally just like one of those Garfield stickers. He all fours wrapped. He wrapped around my leg. Thankfully, I was wearing jeans because he yeah. clawed onto me. And and I'm trying to walk, and he's like, he's on my leg. And I'm, did he, did, I'm did you let him keep his claws or no? Oh yeah, hell yeah. Oh wow. Yeah, yeah. My yeah. my wife has actually lunched with your wife, and she really enjoys her company. Like you know, and that's saying something. My wife doesn't enjoy that's awesome. her company. So. Oh, that's awesome! You know, Denise is fabulous. She's great. Yeah. Like she's when Rich great. comes so over, she's all like, "Oh, Rich is coming." She's like, "Rich is coming." How I'm you? Uncle Rich for the for all the kids for everyone's kids. I'm Uncle Rich. <laughs> I mean, literally, this is my lot in life. Um, it's kind of fun because you know what you do. You can kind of like impact them, have fun with them, and then you give them back to their parents. Parents. There you go. You there. pay for their college education. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if we're doing that. So. Oh, yeah. That's an interesting yeah. conversation. Well, Vale, man, you know that I have n mad respect for you, man. Just and thank you so much for sharing your talent. This is that right. time of the show where Jim is probably going to come at you with a random question. It's uh -oh. the random question, random question, random question of the day. All right. Vale. <laughs> Do I sound better now? I, I made an adjustment. Yeah, okay. Much better. 
Much it's better. pretty Good. sexy. Nice. Yeah. Random question. Here we go. And it is random. Okay. What's worth spending more? What's worth spending more on to get the best? Hmm. Um, lawyers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if there's much of a difference between a $400 an hour lawyer and a $500 an hour lawyer, but yeah, you're up there. But, I, I was thinking like ketchup. <laughs> yeah, Heinz. You want to get Heinz for you gotta sure. You got to get the Heinz. Yeah. You got to get, you know. Yeah. Hunt's ketchup is an abomination. <laughs> it's an abomination. No. God, I hope I never get hired to speak for them. Yeah. yeah. You didn't say it. Hunt's, I know. Is, Hunt's is like Avis, you know. We try harder, but we suck. So <laughs> we'll never we're, get there. Yeah. We're not, we're not the best, but we do try harder. <laughs> <laughs> we're not Heinz, but we're Hunt's. That's good. It's, it's, that, was, that was question was too easy. Give me a harder one. You got yeah. another one? Give him another one. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's go uh, another random question. What's the silliest invention you have heard of? Uh, the, uh, the little uh, hairband things that people put around on guitars and basses around on, on their net. Have you seen those? Is that like a hairband like capo? Like a scoochie, like a scrunchie. Yeah. It's like a scrunchie. Yeah. Like a scrunchie. No, it's not, it's not a capo. It, it deadens the open strings. Yeah. And wow. I see a lot of people doing those. I think it was because, uh, you know, some famous people, <laughs> I think, did that. Yep. And a lot of people copy it. It's basically there because you're not good enough to deaden the open strings. Right. And so you don't want them to ring. You know, yeah. it's like if I'm playing and they're going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't you know. want that. Yeah. If you're not oh, good enough man. to not do that, you need one of those scrunchies. That's it's just, like vibraphone. You got to be able to mute the, the 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 other open parts of the chord. Yeah. But yeah. But there are companies. There are major companies that make them. And at first, yeah. I thought it was just somebody somebody took their girlfriend's scrunchie out of their hair and put right. it on there. It's probably how it started. Yeah. But yeah. now they have these things they call them mutes, and I'm thinking mute it's like it's hard enough to hear the bass already why do you want to mute the thing you know it's like you can't <sighs> yeah there's also on the market it, it, it big is there's probably like 10 different manufacturers that make drum muffling devices yeah. you know what i mean and they're all you know there is some validity to the fact that they all sound a little bit different depending on the size what they're made of but you could do great things with uh, gaff tape you know Zero I, rings. I, I prefer gaff tape i like to i go to u-haul get those those moving blankets Put them yeah. over the entire kit. Yeah. And the drummer. <laughs> and you get that rubber, oh, yeah. you get that rubber soul sound. Yeah. <laughs> and then after yeah. about 10 minutes, the drummer passes out and we're all good. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Then you bring in the cajon player. <laughs> and throw a blanket over him. <laughs> right. Vale, I can't I Vale, I can't wait to get in the same room with you at the same time and uh, and give you a giant hug and make music with you. Do you like to be found on the internet? How can people find you? Yeah, well, I'm on all the social media. Uh, I'm Pretty much, I'm in the uh, cesspool. At yes. The social media. Of so the uh, social dilemma. I'm, yep. I'm there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Do you Facebook. have your own podcast? Please say you do. I do. It's called Basically Incorrect. Wow. Are you serious? And, and I do. I've I've done about I don't know thirty some episodes, and uh, some of them were interviews. I interview. I had like an hour long interview with with Jeff Berlin. It was hilarious. And we Beautiful. Played, we played oh and we talked crap. And uh, where I, can we know, find it? At Victor Wooten and all that. It's basically incorrect on YouTube. It's nice. just on my YouTube channel. Basically, incorrect. I love that. We, but and, have you uh, turned it into an actual listenable podcast on the uh, podcast platforms, Apple Store, and all that stuff? I don't know anything about any of that stuff. He's just on but YouTube. I, know I can change the oil in my car, but I don't know how to do that. I think I know what Jim's That's getting at. Since he get produces like 15 podcasts, he's saying to himself, yeah. I, need I will create the intro and be the voice of God for you, and I will help you upload your episodes. Right. That's, That's right. He's making a, a light sale right now. I know him like the back of my hand. <laughs> He's making a light sale. Are you still doing well, the, I the, uh, I know the front of your hand pretty good. <laughs> the two of us. Is he doing you know, the, are you still doing the Vale Johnson daily debriefing? What was that? Yeah, that, that was part of the basically incorrect channel. Gotcha. My, my daily debriefing. Yeah. Good man. Well, I will. Hopefully everybody will yeah. reach out to you. Jim, this was fun. Wasn't it? It was. I Bale's got a lot of personality. Whoops. Oh, brother. 
Yeah. All I'll right. have to talk with I'll have to talk All with right. you, Jim, about about the podcast thing. I'd love to sure. uh, pick your brain. I'll connect you guys. We'll, uh, yeah. That'd be great. We can do that. That'd be great. Via email. Well, Vale, we'll so much. Camping. Thank you so much for your time and talent, buddy. I know that you've changed the world of music, and I think that Kenny G is a lucky man to have you. And I can't wait to make right, some more you. music with you, buddy. That would be great. Really fantastic. Jim, always thank you for your time and talent and your uh, personality and your Marvel gear and your sound effects. I right. really do appreciate it. Give me a whip or something. That's, uh, He's got to label the buttons, Vale. Down. He still hasn't. There we go. He, he still hasn't labeled the buttons. He'll get around to it. Uh, but hey, for you guys and gals that are listening bondage. out there. Yeah. <laughs> bondage. Yes. Um, painful, bloody. We've got a case of, of talking on each other's Zoom. They haven't really gotten that down on the Zoom thing. Hopefully, the uh, latency will be fixed at one point so people can jam with each other in real time. Like, Because when some, one of our guests is playing, I want to pick up a shaker or a cajon or something, and it's just you know it's going to be so latent and so bad. But uh, It's a little thank- late in our lives to be concerned with latency. <laughs> I think that that ship has sailed. For sure. If you or a loved one has been smitten by latency... <laughs> Yeah. Call the law offices of, uh, <laughs> of you know, Jacob- Epstein, and Epstein, and Epstein. Yes, yeah. for sure. Well, thank that you guys for uh, eight hundred dollar an hour lawyers that I was talking about. Yes, you pay more for you. You get what you pay for for sure. <laughs> for sure. Hey, thanks for the support, everyone. Hey, if you guys have praise or you have got some suggestions for Jim and I, I've got an email address for you: the Rich Redmond Show at gmail dot com. As always. Leave us a rating, subscribe, share, rate, review. We always appreciate it. It allows people to find the podcast faster. And as always, keep coming back for the good stuff. We'll be here. We'll see you next time. Thanks, Vale. Yeah, man. You got it. This has been the Rich Redman Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredman.com.